الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونزلنا عليك الكتابة بيانا لكل شيء وهدى ورحمة وبشرى للمسلمين صدق الله العظيم Respected Imam, brothers and sisters, here at Masjid, what's the name of the Masjid? Mujahideen. Masjid Al-Mujahideen in uh, Daman Sarau Tama uh, in Kuala Lumpur. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Before we begin tonight's topic, let me take this opportunity to pay tribute to the memory of one who was my neighbor. I am from Trinidad and Tobago, and he was my neighbor in Venezuela. My brother, in Spanish, mi hermano, Hugo Chavez, who was a friend a friend of Islam, a friend of Muslims. And as a consequence, we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might have mercy on his soul. His status in the Quran is for yaghfiru li man yasha wa yu'adhibu man yasha. Forty years ago, when I was a student at university studying Latin American politics and economics, I was introduced to the Latin American statesman, Juan Domingo Alvarado, who wrote a very famous book entitled Sharks and Sardines. Sharks and Sardines. So many decades ago, Latin America was able to recognize what so many in the world of Islam today, our leaders still cannot recognize. I don't know where we get our leaders from, particularly in Bangladesh. Particularly in Bangladesh that we live in a world order today which is comprised of sharks and sardines. And Hugo Chavez stood up courageously as a soldier, as a politician and as a statesman to defy the sharks. And he did it so successfully that all of South America, all of Central America, except those who worship the sharks, are proud of him and now weep for him. He not only stood up to defy the sharks of the world, but he also stood up to support the sardines of the world. And how we wish that we could have leaders in the world of Islam would follow in the heroic footsteps of Hugo Chavez. May Allah have mercy on his soul. Our topic is entitled Basira, an introduction to Islamic spirituality. And it is not the first time that we are addressing this subject. 20, 30 years ago, there was no internet. I was in New York and I would take one topic and I would repeat the topic in 16 or 20 different locations for one month. And at the end of one month, I would have known the topic by heart. 
repeating it over and over again in different masajid, different Islamic centers in the tri-state area of New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. Because there were different audiences. And now we have the internet. And so when they hear me on the internet, and then they hear the lecture repeated, they say, Sheikh, you're repeating yourself. <laughs> yes, but I'm not only teaching you, I'm teaching so many others. So be patient, and if you've heard the lecture already before, then do please turn to something else and not devote your time to listening to it again and again. What is Islamic spirituality? What is it? What is Basira? And how important is this subject in Akhiru Zaman? Basira or Islamic spirituality is defined as being able to see with the nur of Allah full stop and uh, the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam gave a warning he said ittaku firasat al mu'min fear the firasa of the one who possesses true faith for innahu yanzuru bin nurillah for when he sees he sees with more than a phd from uie in bombak he sees with the nur of allah they don't teach this subject anymore in secular institutions called universities no and so we have to teach it once again in the masjid the house of allah the definition of islamic spirituality which is derived from this hadith is the capacity to see with the nur of allah how important it is to pursue islamic spirituality to be able to see with the nur of allah in akhiru zaman you know you are living in akhiru zaman when for example did he not say sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam that woman would be dressed and yet naked has that already come to the world did he not say at that time of that feminist revolution which will be also a sexual revolution that people will have sexual intercourse in public like donkeys if it has not as yet reached it's not far away we are living in akhiru zaman and if you want your children to grow up in that kind of a society that's your choice our choice is to withdraw when we see this revolution withdraw and take our wives and take our children to an atmosphere a society which is purer in in the remote countryside where we will build small communities and where we will try to live the way of life of islam if this is akhiru zaman then remember the mastermind of akhiru zaman is al-masih al-dajjal about whom the Prophet said sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam every Prophet has warned his people about Dajjal you've heard it so many times you could end the hadith for me now every Prophet has warned his people about Dajjal 
And the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam warned his people about Dajjal. Hadith of Sahih Bukhari. But I am going to tell you something that no one has ever said before. So this is saved for the last. So this must be of absolutely crucial importance. What is it? The Jal sees with the left eye. He's blind in the right eye. It looks like a bulging grip. But your Lord is not one-eyed. Between his eyes on his forehead is written the word Kafir. Kaf fa ra. Disbeliever. And every mu'min will be able to read kafir. Whether that mu'min is katib or ghayru katib. Whether he is literate or illiterate, he still be able to read kafir. In previous lectures, we have interpreted this religious symbolism. But there are those who are pursuing or adopting a different methodology, the Salafi. And uh, I am not wearing any boxing gloves. No. This is an intellectual discourse. No boxing gloves. And they say that if Allah and his messenger have not interpreted, we have no right to interpret. And so they are waiting for someone who will stand up and declare, I am Al-Masih, the Messiah. But in order to recognize him as the false Messiah or Dajjal, he has to be literally one-eyed. Meaning he has to be blind in the right eye like Moshe Dayan. No? And then they will say, oh, here he is, this is Dajjal. And I say to them with the Salafi methodology, you got a long wait ahead of you. We have interpreted this as religious symbolism. And we have all, always, always warned our audience. When we give our opinion, do not accept our opinion unless and until you are convinced that it is correct this is the respect we show for the intellect of those who want to learn from us and so we said that when he sees with his left eye the left eye symbolizes external sight and when he is blind in the right eye it symbolizes internal blindness so he's only one track in knowledge knowledge comes to him only from the scientific method external observation and experiment and experimentation and rational inquiry but surah al kahf of the quran introduces us to he who is the answer to Dajjal, namely Khidr alayhi salam. And Khidr alayhi salam sees with two eyes, <laughs> while Dajjal sees with one. So Khidr alayhi salam is the supreme guide for us, given in Surah Al Kaf of Islamic spirituality. Because Allah says about him, وَعَلَّمْنَاهُ مِنْ لَدُنَّ عِلْمَ بَعْدَ أُغْزِ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَعَلَّمْنَاهُ مِنْ لَدُنَّ عِلْمَ Not only does he have knowledge which comes from this world but also he has knowledge which he receives internally. And so he is the answer to Dajjal. How important is it that we follow 
the footsteps of Khidr alayhi salam to protect ourselves from Dajjal, one-eyed Dajjal. How important it is therefore that we pursue Islamic spirituality. The Prophet said sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam and you've heard it so many times that Dajjal comes with two things a river and the fire but his river is a fire and his fire is the cool waters of a river whosoever falls in his river will have his load of sins increased and whosoever falls in his fire would have his load of sins decreased in implying that in Akhiru Zaman when you see the feminist revolution you know this is Dajjal because did he not say Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam The link between Dajjal and the feminist revolution Did he not say That the last people To come out to Dajjal To follow him Would be women Yes And a man would have to return to his home And tie down Meaning coercively restrain his wife, his sister, his daughter to protect them from the fitna of Dajjal so when you see the feminist revolution and its accompanying sexual revolution people engaging in sexual intercourse in public in my country in Trinidad and there are those from Trinidad who will be listening to the lecture we have something called carnival two days when shaitan takes control otherwise he's always in control but these two days he's expressly overtly in control and uh, people masquerade and they go out on the streets and they dance and uh, in in trinidad they are simulating sexual intercourse on the streets they used to be having on minimum amount of clothing minimum amount of clothing but now they have something new they use something called body paint to pretend that you have on clothing when in fact you're naked so when you see that sexual revolution if you still do not recognize that Dajjal is around and he's the mastermind then you are living in dreamland <laughs> you better wake up so in the age of Dajjal when the river will be a fire and the fire will be the cool waters of a river the implication would be that things would not be what they appear to be appearance and reality would be opposite to each other and if you see with only one eye external sight you would be deceived and the only time you'll be able to penetrate the reality of things as for example I have it here I have it right here as for example this piece of bogus fraudulent and <coughs> utterly haram <coughs> paper which masquerades as money I can use this language because I know my subject I'm not talking out of my hat this piece of bogus and fraudulent and utterly haram paper which masquerades as money if you see with only one eye you will believe that this is halal what's wrong with this monetary system you can't see 
you just like cattle. But when you see with two eyes, and when like Khidr alayhi salam in Surah al kahf you are located at Majma'ul Bahrain. Remember the term? In Surah al kahf Musa alayhi salam says, I am the most learned of all men. And did not mention Allah as the most learned. And Allah said to him, no you are not. There is one more learned than you. And he says, I want to meet him. And Surah al kahf tells us, that you will meet him at Majma'ul Bahrain at the place where the two oceans meet if you follow the Salafi methodology then you better buy a ticket to Cape Town and drive up the Table Mountains and they'll show you a place where the two oceans meet out there on the southern tip of Africa and then you can start searching out there for the most learned of all men. But I think you've got a long, long, long search ahead of you. If you follow our methodology, then this is religious symbolism. And we interpret it to be two oceans of knowledge. An ocean of knowledge externally acquired and an ocean of knowledge internally received and when these two oceans of knowledge are harmoniously integrated with each other then you have the most learned of all men you have a khidr alayhi salam and only that road will give you the capacity to penetrate the reality of things and not be deceived as we have been deceived all of us with this bogus and fraudulent and utterly haram paper currencies and when we try to bring back that money which is in the Quran and that money which is in the Sunnah and that money which will be used when Imam al-Mahdi emerges and that money which will be used when Nabi Isa alayhi salam returns namely dinar and dirham gold and silver we can't get support no we get support from university students but we're still waiting for support from the muftis of Islam we're still waiting from support for support from the ulama. It's been 20, 30 years now that this voice has been like a voice crying in the wilderness. And we are no closer today to restoring that money which we used to have before we were attacked by Dajjal. And that money was removed and replaced with this bogus and fraudulent money. So if we are to penetrate the reality of things, this is how important the subject is of Islamic spirituality or uh, Basira. I regret that I had to spend so much time in this introduction <laughs> because there's so much more. How then do we analyze the subject of noor or light? The subject can be divided into two parts. In one part we look at it theoretically. And in the other part where you'll be more interested, practically. What do we do to get noor? Hmm? Theoretically, we have to turn to Surah to nur There is a Surah of the Quran entitled Surah to nur So this is the first Surah to which we should turn. And in Surah to nur Ayah number 35, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us that pivotally important Ayah of the Quran in which He says, 
Allah nurus samawati wal ard ila akhir al ayah that Allah is the nur of the samawat and do not translate samawat as heavens heaven is jannah samawat is not heaven samawat is the different worlds of space and time the seven different worlds of space and time that Allah has created alongside this material universe Allah is the nur of the samawat and of the earth and Allah is the nur of all creation hence everything created has come from Noor. <coughs> Everything created has its origin in Noor. This is deducible from the statement Allahu Nurus Samawati Wal Ak. When Allah began creation, he first created the angels and the angels are created from Noor and then perhaps since light Noor has within it heat it is possible that part of the world of Noor was transformed into fire not the fire with which we cook but a smokeless fire and from this fire he created the jinn and then perhaps part of the world of fire cool down to become clay teen teen and with this Allah created the human being if this theory is correct then the human being is originally light and he traversed from light through fire to clay and uh, the return trip is back to light in the process of creating these three categories of beings Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also created the material universe and also the seven worlds of space and time <coughs> but then he said to the angels that I'm going to place the human being as my khalifa here in the material universe the angels can be here the jinn can be here but we can't see them and they, not, they cannot function in the historical process because they don't have a body that can operate in this world if an angel assumes a human form then the angel can walk amongst us and we would think it's a human being but actually it's still an angel if a jinn assumes a human form then the jinn can walk amongst us we would not know it's a jinn but if you were to offer the angel who has come as a human being offer the angel some food some nasi goreng can the angel eat it? 
No. <laughs> the angel is appearing as a human being, but the angel cannot eat food. Can you offer some food to the jinn? The jinn cannot eat it. No. So, although they are appearing in human form, they are still jinn and angels. Now then, when Allah created the angels, He gave to the angels something called self-consciousness. The capacity to say, I. Hmm? I am Jibra'il alayhi salam and you are the messenger of Allah. Hmm? The angel said, so angels have self-consciousness. But angels cannot make choice. They don't have a self-directed will. They therefore cannot commit sin. Rather, angels must do whatever they are ordered to do. وَيَفَعَلُونَ مَا يُؤْمَرُونَ nor do angels have the capacity to think creatively. No. To think independently. No. La ilma lana illa ma allamtana. We have no knowledge other than that which you give to us. So this is the status of the angels in this road towards Islamic spirituality they have the least amount of what we call personality but what about the jinn? does a jinn have a name? oh yes Iblis has a name can a jinn say I? yes Iblis says Ana khayru minhu. I am better than him خَلَقْتَنِي مِن نَار You created me from fire وَخَلَقْتَهُ مِن طِينَ And you created him from clay. So the jinn possess self-consciousness. Can Does a jinn possess a self-directed will? Can a jinn choose? Yes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks Iblis Iblis when I ordered you to bow down, to prostrate, why did you not? He said, well, I am better than him, why should I? <laughs> Meaning, he had the capacity to choose. He had a self-directed will. So he is in a superior status of personality than angels. Does the jinn possess independent knowledge? Can he think independently? Yes! This is the master logician arguing with Allah. You created me from fire. You created him from clay. And they taught me at university that fire is superior to clay. It follows logically therefrom, I am superior to him. Pulls up. This is the logician. Hmm? And so the jinn do possess a creative intellect. But they have limitations, the jinn. The famous example of the limited intellectual capacity, the limited rational faculty of a jinn, is the story in the Quran of the death of whom? Of? Yes, you said it. Suleiman alayhi salam. Suleiman alayhi salam died while sitting on a chair with his staff. And he's dead. And the jinn are walking under his command. And they did not know he was dead. And they kept on walking and walking and walking and walking and walking. Until the battle out termite here began eating of the stick and when the equilibrium was lost 
then the body toppled over. <laughs> if the termite had not done that, the jinn would have kept on working, not knowing that he was dead. But when we come to the human being, remember, Islamic spirituality or Basira reaches its highest status now. You must know who you are. And you must know what you are capable of. Not only does a human being possess self-consciousness, the capacity to say, I, this is mine, hmm? but also the human being possesses a self-directed will. فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا Each human being has been inspired with the capacity to either pursue the path of virtue or the path of sin and evil. And you have a limited capacity to choose. To the extent that you have freedom to choose, you are accountable for your choice. Hmm? Finally, not only does a human being possess self-consciousness and a self-directed will, but he possesses the creative intellect. A capacity to pursue knowledge independently. A capacity to extend the frontiers of knowledge. That's what you have. Are you using it? <laughs> and when Allah, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks in the Quran of Noor, in that famous ayah 35 of Surah An Noor, He ends this ayah with the statement. Wallahu bi kulli shay'in alim meaning that the primary function of nur is for knowledge and so Islamic spirituality is meant to function primarily in the pursuit of knowledge and it is not only external knowledge but also internal knowledge and the integration of these two. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam was on the battlefield of uh, Uhad with the Muslim army. And there was one companion of his who got married the night before. So he was given permission to spend the night with his wife. He spent the night with his wife, he consummated the marriage, and in the morning he got up, he made his ghusl, because he was in the state of Janaba, and uh, then he performed his salat. And now he's saying goodbye to her, so he can head for the battlefield. When she held on to him, and he had to have relations with her one more time and then in the state of Janaba without having made ghusl he ran to the battlefield and he jumped into the battlefield and fought and was killed Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam was then seen looking up in the sky and saying subhanallah 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 so the companions who were around him looked up, they saw nothing. After the battle was over, they asked, O oh, Messenger of Allah, what was that? Subhanallah, Subhanallah, Subhanallah. He said, your best, your companion who got married night before and who uh, was left with his wife and then this morning he came and he joined us and he was killed in the battle. I saw his body up there in the sky and I saw the angels giving the body 
חוסר. Oh, but there was another body on the ground. This one was made of clay. So what was that one made of? <laughs> that one had to have the same shape, same features as this one. So you could recognize who he is. This is the physical body. That's the spiritual body. In pursuing spirituality, we have to recognize that the human being is comprised of a physical body. The Quran refers to the physical body of Fir'aun in Surah to Yunus. This day, Fir'aun, we are going to preserve your badan, your physical body. So the human being has a physical body, which if it is not preserved, would, uh, what? The, the worms will eat it up. But in addition to the physical body, the human being possesses a nafs. وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا Allah created the nafs and Allah fashioned the nafs. Huh? The nafs is you. You are not your body so much. Because if you lose half of your body, people don't say you have Imran now. Do they say that? If you lose your legs and you only have the top portion of your body, this is half of Imran. No, you're still Imran, <laughs> even if you lost, lost half of your physical body. Because Imran is not the physical body. The physical body is being used or inhabited by Imran. But the physical body is not Imran. So then, who or what is Imran? It is the nafs. It is the nafs which will stand before Allah on Judgment Day to be tried. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may cover our sins and forgive us our sins and have mercy on our souls, you and I, on that day. Ameen. But there's something else. But there's something else in addition to the physical body and in addition to the nafs, there is the ruh. And we'll turn to the ruh, inshallah, after the azan. The physical body has a physical heart. And when this goes bad, then you go to the heart specialists called the cardiologist. Hmm? But when Allah says in the Quran, Fi bihim marad, that in their hearts there is a disease. Is he talking about the physical heart that you can go to the pharmacy and buy some tablets, some medicine to cure the disease of the heart? No. No, he's not talking about the physical heart. Not at all. Well then, which heart is he talking about? Fi kulubihim marat. In their hearts there is a disease. That spiritual body up there in the sky, which was being given the ghusl, also has a heart. <laughs> a spiritual heart. So in addition to the physical heart, we also have the spiritual heart. We have a physical heart and we have a spiritual heart. It is with the spiritual heart that we see. But no, where is the evidence? Allah says in the Quran, 
Afalam yasiru fil ard. Will they not travel through the earth? Perchance that by traveling to the earth, the dead heart might come alive. Not the one that the cardiologist is treating. No, no, the other one. فَتَكُونَ لَهُمْ كُلُومُ يَعْكِلُونَ بِهَا And when the dead heart comes alive, then they're able to use that heart with which to be able to pursue knowledge. أَوْ ذَيْعَذَانٌ يَسْمَعُونَ بِهَا and when the dead heart comes alive, then they'll be, able, they'll be able to hear what otherwise they were not hearing. For innaha la ta'amal absar. No, it's not these eyes which are blind. Walakin ta'amal kulub. Walakin ta'amal kulub allati fi sudur. What is blind is the heart which is inside the chest, not the head. <laughs> the chest, not the head. And so the spiritual heart in the chest of the spiritual body, that is where you see with the nur of Allah. We now have to turn to this fascinating part of the subject called the Ruh. I think it was Molana Jalaluddin Rumi in his Masnavi who gave the analogy of the relationship between the nafs and the ruh to that of a rider and a horse. <laughs> that the nafs is the traveler who travels and the ruh is the vehicle with which he travels. Hmm? The nafs has to be prepared for the journey before it can travel. You need to get your passport. You need to get a visa. You need to buy the ticket from the travel agency. All of these things. Before you can travel. So the nafs has to go on a journey to prepare for travel. And uh, if you go to my teacher, uh, Maulana Dr. Muhammad Fadlur Rahman Ansari, Rahimahullah, in his masterpiece, The Quranic Foundations and Structure of Muslim Society, we have the book outside in two volumes. You see he has a chapter in volume one entitled Tazkiyah, the process of preparing for the journey or the process of purification of the nafs. The Quran speaks about a nafs al -ammara the self which is prone to evil and then that nafsul ammara is purified and as it is purified it begins to reflect upon all the sins it has committed in life and it reproaches itself and now it has become nafsul lawama and after it surmounts that process of reproaching itself it reaches a state of satisfaction, nafsul mutmainna, pleased with itself, and Allah is pleased with it. Now you're ready to travel. The Quran gives in that same ayah, ayah to nur of Surah to nur. It also gives us the methodology of preparation for the travel. It says that Allah is the nur of the heavens and of the earth and the example of his nur is a hollow space or a niche and Nabi Muhammad said located in the heart, in the chest 
And in that hollow space there is a lamp, a misbah. And that lamp has a glass around it, zujaja. And that glass has to be cleaned, remove all the stains on the glass. And then the glass has to be polished. The removal of the stains is the tezkiah, and there's a chapter on tezkiah in that book I mentioned, my teacher's book, which is outside. And then you have to polish the glass, and that is the zikr, the process of zikr, zikrullah, to polish the glass. But that's not all. In addition to cleaning and polishing the glass, this verse of the Quran tells us you need oil for the lamp. And you're not going to get oil for the lamp going to work in the morning, facing the morning traffic, coming back home in the evening, facing the evening traffic, then you're having your dinner, and then you sit down and watch television until it's time to sleep. And then the next day you do the same thing, and the next day you do the same thing, and then when the weekend time comes, well, that's the time to go shopping and go sightseeing and so on. And that's how you spend your life. No. You're not going to get any oil that way. No. In order to get oil, you have to do more than be in Ibadah, for example, day and night in Ibadah. That one is going to work in the morning, coming home in the evening. But this one is constantly in Ibadah. Morning and night, he's in Ibadah. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Jibra'il alayhi salam to destroy that town. So Jibra'il alayhi salam said, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but in that town is this servant of yours, who is constantly in ibadah. But in that town there are sharks, and the sharks are gobbling up the sardines. And this man does nothing. He doesn't even raise his little finger to stand up to the oppressor and to liberate the oppressed. Because if I do that, they will put my name on a no-fly list. If I do that, I won't have freedom to travel. I won't get a visa. U.S. visa. If I do that, my business will collapse. If I do that, I won't get promotion in my job. If I do that, people will say, I'm a terrorist. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? So he does nothing. Day and night, Ibadah. So Jibra'il alayhi salam asks, shall we, what about him? To which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replied and says, destroy him and destroy the town. Destroy him and destroy the town. You need oil. And you cannot get oil unless you work for it. In your heart there must be a restlessness. That when I see that which is munkar, I want to change it with my hand. And if I can't change it with my hand, I want to change it with my tongue. And if I can't change it with my tongue, I want to change it with my heart. And then pack up and get out of the city and head for the remote countryside. So when the ship sinks, I won't sink with that ship. Hugo Chavez set the example for us of a man who stood up against the sharks and worked to liberate the Shadins. He didn't seek to bridge, bring the sharks and the Shadins together in one Jamaat. <laughs> no. So in order in order for you to be able 
to reach that state where the nafs can now receive nur you need oil what have you done for Islam that the truth might triumph in the world that the truth might triumph over all rivals what have you done if you are a young man and you're listening to me today in any part of the world I know your heart is beating and vibrating you want to do something but those who have grown old and the dunya has embraced them that's a different story and so now that you are eligible for nur the growth of the soul has taken of the self not the, not the soul the self has taken place from amara to lawama to mutmainna we now have cleaned the glass we have polished it through the remembrance of Allah we are producing oil by standing up against that which is wrong and standing up for that which is right regardless of the price that we have to pay now we are eligible for nur but Allah says Allah guides to his nur whomsoever Allah chooses to guide so although you may be eligible for nur it is when Allah gives it to you and Allah may not give it to everyone how will we know that we have nur this part of the lecture is frightening, is terrifying. When we are raised for judgment, there are three critical moments that we will face. The first is when we are put on a scale to be weighed. In this world we may weigh heavy. When our car pulls up, people are there to open the door for us. <laughs> but on that day when we are put on the scale we may not weigh as much as a house fly hmm? and then comes the second critical moment when our book is granted to us and when the sinful person looks at that book he says ma li al kitab what kind of a book is this? لا يغادر صغيرة ولا كبيرة إلا أحصاها. Nothing is left out in this book. Everything is there, big and small. If the book is handed to us in our right hand, alhamdulillah. But if the book is handed in our left hand or behind our back, that's bad news. But it's the third one that is really terrifying. The third critical moment will know, you will know whether we have nur or not. <laughs> the third critical moment is when there is a bridge to cross. Great is the wisdom of Allah. Great is the wisdom of Allah. There is heaven, Jannah. It's just there across the bridge. And underneath the bridge is Jahannam. And it's a narrow bridge. And the place is dark for those who have no light. How dark? The Quran says that when they put their hand in front of their face, they can't see their hand. That's how dark it is. If you do not have nur, you cannot cross that bridge. And so there'll be those who will be crossing the bridge. And the Prophet said, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, some have only enough nur to see one step ahead. And others have so much nur they could see from Medina all the way to Yemen. 
as these are crossing the bridge the ones who have no nur are calling out to these can you allow us to walk with you but then the angels intervene and said no go look for your own light so this is how we will know whether or not we have nur on that day when we have to cross the bridge once you become eligible for nur then Allah says Noorun ala nur Every act of worship that you perform and it is accepted by Allah will now be transformed into nur For example the Prophet said A salat nur Salat is nur so if Allah accepts our salat then that salat is transformed into nur but we have a problem he said a salatu miftahul jannah that salat is the key to jannah but he didn't stop there he said, Al wudu miftahu salat. Wudu is the key to salat. And we don't perform wudu anymore. No? You don't believe me? Go to the place where wudu is being performed after listening to the lecture. And if you have tears to weep, weep and you see how they perform wudu today a man was performing wudu and the prophet والسلام, saw him and asked him for an explanation for this israf waste of water so the man was surprised O oh, messenger of Allah is there such a thing as israf in wudu? Yes, said the messenger of Allah. Even if you have a running stream of water before you in Jandabaik, still you must not exceed the limit. What is the limit? How much water should we use for wudu? This is when it's advantageous to have this hut. <laughs> A mud of water can be take, contained in this hut and you still have some left over. Hmm? That's how much water you need for wudu. The Prophet would take a container and pour on his with his left hand paw on his right hand that's the first act of wudu this is the sunnah where is the sunnah today? Huh? the first act of wudu is to pour the water on the right hand the next act of wudu is to take the right hand and dip with it and this much water which is in your hand called a gurfa this is the amount of water to be used in every act of wudu and when you are finished with your wudu if there was any water left in the container he the prophet would drink it or we who would be around we would be rushing to get that water to drink it Shall I introduce you to the wudu of Gog and Magog? Huh? Yeah, Juj and Majuj. One of the trademarks of Yajuj and Majuj is the waste of water. They will pass by a river and drink it dry. And when the world is being attacked by Gog and Magog, you will see water diminishing all over the world. The lakes. The rivers running dry, the lakes going low, ships having to use new parts to navigate the Great Lakes in Canada. Hmm? 
Gog and Magog, they waste water. Overconsumption of water. The new way of performing wudu is that you open the tap and uh, because you're a good Muslim, you open it on, open it, full blast. <laughs> full blast. And uh, no longer are you bothered about this much water. No. That's gone. And when you are washing your mouth, the water is still flowing. And you're washing your nose, the water is still flowing. And you're washing your hands, the water is still flowing. And you're passing your hands over your head, the water is still flowing. And when you collect all of that water, if you collect it, you probably can fill this 50, 60, 100 times. Does that qualify as a valid wudu? If the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu were alive today and they go to the place where wudu is being performed, they'll take sticks and run us out of town. They say these are not Muslims. These are the children of Gog and Magog. These are not Muslims. That's what they'll do to us. And this is the key to Salat. So if you wudu, is the wudu of Gog and Magog, how can your Salat get you nur? And the same thing is applicable to the amount of water you use for ghusl. Hmm? But that's not the only problem that we face. If we want to get nur and Salat, it's a vehicle. The next problem we face is, oh but, mashallah, we have such lovely masajid today. Grand structures, mashallah. I wonder if these were built with paper money. Bogus, fraudulent, and utterly haram paper money. Hmm? If they were built with paper money, Dajjal's money, how can you call it a masjid? How can you call it a masjid? If we want to perform salat and we want to get a, have a chance that our salat would be accepted, well, you better look for some bamboo and some wood and pay the laborer in dirhams. You have no excuse because dirhams in the market now. In fact, we, I think we have a table outside with dirhams. Huh? Dirhams in the market now. So if you're using dirhams to pay for the labor and pay for the material to build the musalla, in Malaysia you call it surah, or the masjid, then you know this is the house of Allah. And if I perform my salat in this building, I have a chance that my salat will be accepted and be transformed into Nur. Now let us turn to the next two which are the major sources of Nur. And with this we'll end. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the books which he has sent down that they all possess Nur. And that the Quran also possesses Nur because this is Kalamullah. And so a major road to Nur for us in this Ummah is the Quran. Even when you write, recite the Quran without understanding the Quran, even then there is Barakah for you. But if you remain like that all your life, Imam is reciting the Quran. مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ حُمِّلُوا التَّوْرَاتَ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَحْمِلُوهَا كَمَثَلِ الْأَصْفَارِ كَمَثَلِ الْحِمَارِ يَحْمِلُوا الْأَصْفَارِ 
And when the Salat is over, someone asks, what did he say? And you reply and said, MashaAllah, it was a lovely tune. He recited beautifully, but I didn't understand what he said. Huh? And if you continue to remain like that, you are disrespecting the Quran. And therefore disrespecting Allah. So it's time to wake up. You have enough time to study nuclear physics? Huh? In MIT? And get a PhD? But you don't have enough time to study enough Arabic to be able to read and understand at least the surface meaning of the Quran? When the Imam is reciting the Quran, you don't know what he is saying? How then can the Quran be a vehicle for Noor? The method in which you show respect for the Quran is to constantly recite it, cover to cover, cover to cover. And when I was in Trinidad, I was doing it once a month, alhamdulillah. But now because of this internet and a hundred emails every day, please don't send any more questions to me because you're denying me the time I need to recite the Quran. Hmm? You must recite the Quran cover to cover. When you finish, you start again. When you finish, you start again. And you must start with your children when they are young. When it becomes a habit for them, every day they recite the Quran, then all through their life the Quran will be there for them. And the Quran will become a vehicle for Noor. But it is not enough to recite the Quran. If you had studied the Quran, you would know what is money. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because we didn't study the Quran and the teacher who taught the Quran we all accepted this bogus paper money and one last avenue for Noor and that is Allah says قَدْ جَاءَكُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ نُورٌ وَكِتَابٌ مُبِينٌ there's come from Allah not only this book but Noor Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu was salam he is also the vehicle through which we can acquire Noor. Not only for those who lived in his time, وَآخَرِينَ مِنْهُمْ لَمَّا يَلْحَقُوا بِهِمْ وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ But Nabi Muhammad also, sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, has an abiding mission to perform. Even for those who did not live in his time, but live in a later time, Nabi Muhammad والسلام, still has a function to perform through whom we can get nur. For example, Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima in by sending salat and salam on Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam, you are already beginning the process of getting him to function as wasila through whom you can get nur. But it makes no sense to be reciting salat and salam on Monday morning, you are there at the bank applying for a loan on interest <laughs> to buy a car or to perform the hajj. No. You have to be faithful to the Messenger of Allah. You have to follow him. In kuntum tuhibbun Allah fattabi'uni yuhibbu Allah. You have to follow him. Follow his sunnah. And if you do that and you love him more than you love your parents, more than you love your children, more than you love all of mankind. And Nabi yu awla bil mu'mineen min anfusihim. The Prophet alayhi salatu waslam is dearer to the believer than their own selves, their parents, their children. So when the time comes for hijrah, because 
I am following the Sunnah of Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam. I hope you're listening to me in France. I hope you're listening to me in Belgium, in Britain, in Canada, in the United States. When the time comes for Hijra, to follow the Sunnah of Hijra, to leave a place where you do not have the freedom to live as a Muslim, you do not have the freedom to stand up against Munkar. You cannot say, as I can say here in Malaysia, there are three kinds of lies. There are normal lies, and then there are great lies, and then there is 9-11, the Zionist 9-11 lie. You can't say that in the United States. They send you to Guantanamo. So you got to make hijra. Go to some part of Allah's earth where you'll have the freedom to live as a Muslim. Your wife can be in hijab. You are following the sunnah. But your parents say, no, we're not going. Or your wife and your children say, you can go, we're, gonna, we're not going. This is heaven. What do you do? What do you do? My lecture ends with this. The, the, the Prophet comes first before everybody else. And Nabi Awla Bil Mu'minina Min Anfusihim. So you follow the Sunnah of Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam and you make hijra. Whether they go with you or they don't go with you, you go. You make your hijra. If you do that, then you are showing love for Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam. Then he can function as a medium through which you can get new. There are other parts of the lecture which I don't have the time to address to you and maybe on another occasion inshallah we'll be able to attend to the other parts which are uh, also important. Rabbana tukhabbal minna inna ka anta samir alim wa tub alayna ya mulana inna ka anta tawab rahim wala aqwa ala nari jahim Allah fahab li tawbata wa ufir dhunubi fa inna ka ghafiru dhambi Fahab li tawbata wa'ufir <tries>